We're going to create a BrowserBox Pro instance. And so we're going to cover all the steps from creating the virtual machine, to adding the domain name, to setting up the virtual machine, installing BrowserBox Pro, and connecting to the running browser instance. So let's get started. First, we'll go to the BrowserBox Pro repository and take a look at the instructions. So basically, we can see here, this is the BrowserBox Pro repository and we've got a troubleshooting section at the start and the section we want to pay attention to is the initial machine setup so basically we need to create a machine and then we'll follow these steps here to kind of ensure that we have the right setup on the machine to then install browserbox pro all right so let's create a machine and you can use any cloud provider or any um, bare metal provider uh, you can just go ahead and create your machine so it's easiest if we do it on Debian, although it does work on other Unix versions or Linux versions. So we'll select a region. Um, we'll just pick a cheap shared CPU one. Four gigabytes to two core is usually pretty good. Um, you can do it on less, but you know may as well if you can afford it. We'll add a mandatory password there. Um, we'll make sure we use the right SSH keys and that's all we need to do so we'll just create that Linode now and also when we create the Linode we need to copy the IP address so that we can SSH into it and we should also add the Linode to a firewall so we've created a special firewall here just for the demonstration purpose so we'll see if the Linode has come up yet uh, yes, I guess it has. So we'll add that Linode to the firewall. And it's still provisioning, but we'll try and SSH in. So we'll bring up our terminal here. And to SSH in, you obviously need to have the correct uh, private key set up on your machine and the corresponding public key you know, in your cloud provider's dashboard. It may not have provisioned yet, so it says it's running, but okay, it's working. All right, so the first thing we want to do once we've logged in as root is we want to go to the browser box instructions and just follow along here. So we want to add a user. You can call it anything you want. Oh. <laughs> Okay, and then we want to lock that user to make sure that you know you just can't log in using it. Um, you can SSH in using it, but you can't log in with a password. Um, and then we want to add a, a new group for sudoers where you don't have to have a password for sudo. And then we want to um, actually add the no password entry for that in by sudo. So we'll go to Vicesudo and we'll copy the little line we need to put in. And we'll save that. Now, we'll add that user to the sudo's uh, group that we just created. And now that user pro can use sudo without having to enter a password. So now that we've followed the initial five steps of the setup, we're all ready to go. So we're going to switch to the pro user, switch to the user's home directory, and now we're going to just update the machine. And while that's going on, we'll just check out the next uh, range of steps there. We've we said we need to open a TCP port block. We've already done that because we've added the Linode to our special firewall, which has the correct ports open. And we can see here that we've, our machine is running. We've got the IP address. Now, the next step we need to do, which we may as well do right now, is we need to add a DNS entry for this IP address so that we can access the host. So we'll just call it something random like porg. 
and we'll add that and that should be pretty instant it should be accessible pretty much instantly but we'll just give it a little bit of um, time to kind of come up there and we'll while we're waiting for that DNS to come up we'll follow the next step in the instructions which is uh, installing git curl and wget so at the point where all of this is installed which is right now we have everything we need to begin installing browser box so we'll go to the next part of the instructions which is installation process and we'll just check out the first two little paragraphs there so make sure you're installing it on a non-root user with pseudo permissions yes we are and we've also already set up our host name so we'll get started now to clone the repository. And we'll start the install script. And we'll put in, as we're required to do, the host name. And we'll see if the DNS is already set up. So the install script is starting. Here it's trying to verify. It may not have set up yet. Oh, it has set up. Okay, so we've got the certificate. At that step, if you if you weren't able to set up the certificate the first time because the DNS has not yet propagated, then you can just run the install script again and it will try it again. So right now we're proceeding with the install script. This will take a while. So we may as well just go back and have a look at the instructions. So now we're at step three here while the install script is running. <clears throat> you may want to fix yourself a tasty beverage or do some breathing exercises or meditation or take a walk. No, just kidding about the walk. It's not going to take that long. But we need to also be present for these um, prompts here. And this prompt is very important. You need to run it the first time. And you can't hit enter or anything. You just have to sit yes. So if you accidentally hit enter, then that won't run and the setup won't work. So you need to like run the whole uh, setup again and uh, it'll be quicker the second time you run it because some things will already have been installed, but you'll need to install, um, you'll need to run that setup machine script. When, so when prompted, you need to say yes. So now it's running the setup machine script and we can kind of go away for a little bit um, and just take a look at the next stage of the install. So the next stage of the install is running the setup program after the install script finishes. And you can pick whatever port you want there. It doesn't have to be 8080, it can be whatever you want. Just make sure that that port is open. And also make sure that you have two ports on either side of that port open because other services um, are gonna be running as well aside from the main um, browser service. And then the final step will be starting the instance. And so that will start it at that port. And the way it works is uh, there's only one BrowserBox instance per actual system or operating system user. So if you want to create two instances running at the same time, you need to create another user and that other user will be able to run you know, a separate instance. So we just make sure that we're answering yes to all these prompts. yourself a bit of water or something wait for all the fonts to install um, and you'll scroll down if you want and you can see that there's actually not much to this it's pretty easy to install it just make sure you have a reasonably fast connection you've got um, you know a reasonably powerful machine I'm not sure the actual SSD size on the Linode instance it may just be 80 gigabytes but that's sufficient although the larger your disk size, the better it is because you can set up some swap and uh, if you're browsing the web a lot, browsing normally caches a lot of content and the cache can actually use quite a lot of disk space. So, you know, depending on your use case, it can be good to have more disk. And you can see that if you're trying to run it locally, there are sometimes there are some issues or problems performance-wise and also you need to make sure that you're running under Rosetta if you're on macOS. 
And if you want to shut down, you can just use PM2, which controls the running of the processes. So remember that um, each instance of BrowserBox is linked to a particular operating system user. And so uh, just running PM2 in the context of that user will give you a list of what's happening. So now we're nearing the end of the install process here. It's just building the um, front end client views. So we can just, yes, and now it's copying the <clears throat> Uh, built files into the operating system's sort of shared area so anyone can access it or anyone can run those commands. Just a couple more steps here to run and then the install process will be complete. So you can you may take a note of this. There there will be some errors sometimes um, displayed throughout the install. And this is maybe one of those places because um, in the past we've used disk quotas to control various things, although there's a shift away from the old C groups type quotas, you know, in Linux these days. Um, and so the following part is more of a legacy uh, part that's not really used much anymore. So it may kind of error, but it won't really matter, right? Um, and that's okay. So basically we have now completed the setup, so we should be able to run, you know, and make whatever port we want, as long as it's a user space port. And we can see that that's worked successfully and we've got an output, a login link there. And so basically what the setup does is it sets up a sort of authentication. You can specify the, the token or the uh, cookie values and all that stuff if you need to but just supplying the port which is the one mandatory argu argument um, it'll spit out a or it'll it'll provide you uh, a um, a login link so it's done that here and now it actually to start the instance you need to run one more command and now it should be up and running so we should be able to connect at this point let's just double check and make sure that you know the services are running so we can run a PM2 list they are running and we can check out the logs as well and you can see that this line here is something you will become familiar with it actually means that we've managed to connect to the browser that's running so that little green tick there means that our um, browser box application is connected to the browser engine that it's going to be instrumenting so we're all ready then to connect and we can just pop our login link in up here <laughs> so I have to go back up, find the login link, <laughs> and here we go. So we can pop our poor login link here, and we should be connecting to the browser box, and we are. We see that we've got the browser box here. Uh, we need to create a tab, and then we can check something out, like uh, and we can see that that's what we have. So we can start browsing the internet, um, you know, checking this out. We can see that it's not really laggy, even though everything we're looking at is an image. Um, you may want to go full screen. Let's say we check out a video, what's HTTPS? Oh, we've got to watch an ad. Build your brand online with a beautiful logo. And you can see Just go really to Wix Logo Maker. Because if we stop it, you know, everything stops straight away. So there's not really a measurable, sort of human measurable amount of lag that's going on. To start, type the business name and add the tagline. And welcome to the first lesson for this comprehensive web design series. Now, this first set of videos is going to be covering what I call... So I will just cut that there, just to demonstrate that it's basically an interactive real-time system. So so you can see that basically there's no sort of sort of measurable, you know, perceptible lag. I mean, it's obviously not as, you know, high frame rate or whatever is running a regular browser on your device, but, you know, it is pretty close. 
And remember that this is running on a shared CPU VPS with only four gigabytes of RAM and two cores. So this is actually a pretty low spec machine. If you use a much higher spec machine, you'll notice that everything's that much quicker as well. So we'll check out this boring Cloudflare page about what's HTTPS. <laughs> Just kidding, Cloudflare, I'm sure it's not boring. I'm sure someone has put a lot of effort into building that, so we're definitely not against that. Um, sorry, Cloudflare, please don't hate us. Okay, we've got some strange videos from Japan here because the server's in Japan. And we can just go back to the previous page and continue our video. And we may as well switch the sound back on. Comprehensive web design series. Now this first set of videos is going to be covering what I call internet infrastructure, which we're going to try to demystify some of the way the internet works. We're going to be talking about routers and servers and internet connections here. and some of the is requesting so it's going to respond back and send back a response with sort of yes or no and if it has the files that were requested okay so you can basically say it's just like a regular browser you can create tabs you can destroy tabs and um yeah so that's how you do everything you need to set up a browser box instance now let's just make sure what happens if we actually kind of shut it down so we'll get out of the logging there we may as well. Can I use PM2 stop all? I can, yeah. And so you can see that it stops there. And that is all you need to do to go from GitHub repository to a running remote browser isolation uh, system. That's all the steps. Uh, it doesn't take very long and it's pretty easy. So remember that BrowseBox Pro uh, is a kind of fully developed remote browser system that is free for non-commercial use so if you're a researcher or you're a member of a public institution or a government agency using browserbox pro is completely free and unrestricted the only um, cost associated is if you are using for commercial purposes so you're part of a company or you want to deploy it internally or as part of a product in that case you do need to purchase a license and you can do that by going to our website here so just our very simple BrowserBox license purchase website. You can see we've got our payment processor integration right here. Um, and the pricing is cheap per seat, but you need to purchase a lot of seats. Um, but there are volume discounts. So the minimum is a thousand licenses if you want to uh, pay per yearly. And then you can also purchase perpetual licenses as well. And in that case, the minimum's you know, 40 licenses. And there's a higher per seat cost, but you, know, you don't have to renew the license every year. And so those licenses give you full access to the source code, you can customize it, and you can use it in customer facing products you know, at no extra charge. So that's how simple it is to set up remote browser isolation and to start using this, whether you're part of a public institution using it non-commercially or even using it commercially. So it's as easy as setting it up from GitHub and if you're using it commercially, purchasing a license. All right, so thanks and you know, check back to our company channel for other content related to BrowserBox Pro and our other products and have a good rest of your day.